Thank you. OK. Let's do that again. All right, welcome to the latest episode of the Zcash Gardening Club. Uh, it's December 7th, 2021. And um, so for today's agenda, we have um, this welcome message, a few short announcements. Um, and then we have Dan Connolly from Agoric, uh, who's going to give a presentation on how to develop smart contracts. So I'm really excited for that. And then as always in the Zcash Gardening Club, if anyone um, wants to raise their hand to share about any open source development they're working on related to Zcash, either um, you know, sharing a new project idea or sharing an update for a project you're working on, please uh, mention that in the chat. And there's a spot at the end of the meeting for that kind of show and tell. And if we have time, we can have open discussion after that. Um, so Gardening Club is a monthly uh, meeting for Zcash open source developers to get together and share things that they're working on and um, make those connections. So welcome. OK, some announcements. Um, this is the last Gardening Club of the year. They're monthly. This is December. Uh, and however, we're skipping the January one. Um, it happens like right after the holidays. And we figure it's better to uh, just follow up in February. And we have two announcements here. These are a bit older, but worth repeating if, if you haven't um, noticed them yet. So ECC uh, has published a new product roadmap. And we've described sort of a three-year plan where we intend to focus on developing an end user wallet and focus a lot on usability around that and um, shielded by default functionality. And then we're also doing protocol research into proof of stake and interoperability. Uh, and that's kind of a segue to today's topic. Uh, we also published um, sort of a summary of different kinds of um, market research and economics uh, research we did around ZSAs. Um, so that, that stands for Zcash Shielded Assets. And this is the notion of future protocol uh, features that could enable um, multiple assets on the Zcash blockchain. Um, so we've published that. If you haven't noticed elsewhere, um, there is a company called Kedit who has applied for a large grant to um, like carry forward development of ZSAs. So you should check out both their announcement and our blog post if that's something of interest to you. All right, so um, our guest today is Dan Connolly. He's an engineer at Agoric. Uh, and I wanted to sort of describe a little bit how um, I ended up inviting him here. So Agoric is a smart contract platform. It's um, in the Cosmos uh, ecosystem. And uh, ECC is an investor in Agoric. Um, and I'm really excited about their approach to smart contracting. I, I uh, am, am very hopeful for it. And uh, <clears throat> because one of the main strategic protocol goals at ECC on our roadmap is interoperability, uh, I thought it would be interesting to hear about developing Agoric smart contracts kind of at this early phase of their network's life cycle. And, um, you know, with an eye, of course, I have an eye on how that might interact with Zcash in the future. Um, and so I invited Dan because he was <clears throat> very helpful in the Agoric Discord answering questions about uh, smart contract development. And so without further ado, Dan, do you have, um, are you ready to share? Yes, hi, thanks. All right, how are we doing? You seeing my screen? Looks yes. good. All right, so you uh, took care of that stuff and you mentioned that stuff. So I'm gonna go right into it here. 
So these are, this is a talk given by uh, Kate Sills in 2019. Um, uh, she does really, did really great work. Um, so uh, a little bit quickly through this, uh, offer safety partitioning risk in smart contracts. So sort of starting with the Agoric special sauce in a way. Uh, there's a bunch of parts to it, but uh, I'm going to focus on one layer. Um, so what's a smart contract? Um, it's a, it's a contract-like arrangement expressed in code where the behavior of the program expresses the, uh, enforces the terms of the contract. So we look at it as pretty broadly, including things like eBay and, and uh, um, Amazon and things like that. Those are all small con smart contracts too, the way we look at it. Okay, so um, a lot of stuff goes on in blockchains with the one-time payment payments, uh, one-way payments, right? Al sends some tokens to Bob. Um, and after that, Bob has some tokens, uh, but a lot of, Stuff in the way business is done is Alice will give Bob an X if Bob will give uh, Alice a Y, right? I'll buy a widget for 10 bucks or something. <clears throat> you don't just give somebody 10 bucks, you exchange 10, uh, 10 bucks for a widget. Um, the trick is, uh, you know, Alice gives 10 bucks to Bob and now Bob's got the widget and the 10 bucks and he could skate. Um, and this has been a problem for a long time. Kate knows more about these philosophers than I do. Um, Okay, so one thing you can do with this new technology is Alice and Bob can both give their stuff to the smart contract and the smart contract can redistribute the rights. Yay. Okay, but, um, and so Alice and Bob never have uh, access to both at X and Y at the same time. Uh, this is great. Okay, so what if the smart contract is buggy or malicious? And this is not a theoretical question. It happens a lot. Uh, I don't expect I need to go into that uh, in this audience, um, zillions of dollars went away. Okay, uh, so Mark Miller is our chief scientist and he kind of had this idea, what if we never give the digital assets to the smart contract? So uh, the way we partition risk in this uh, Zoe is the Agoric smart contract framework is uh, there's two jobs. One is escrowing and redistributing the digital assets. And the other job is deciding how the digital assets should be redistributed. So the escrowing and redistributing is done by Zoe, which is this uh, you know, sort of platform component. And then digital deciding how the assets should be redistributed is you know, a zillion different contracts, right? Swap, auction, exchange. We've got several of them de de developed. We hope you'll develop more. Okay, and the way it's, it's based on these things, not just sending stuff in a transaction, it's based on offers. And an offer has a want and a, and a and a give. It says offers here. Uh, the current implementation is, is give. So Alice wants a Y and she offers an X and Bob wants an X and offers a Y. Feed these both into Zoe and you get a match and the rights get exchanged. Uh, and so there's this property called offer safety where both parties are guaranteed, all the parties are guaranteed that they either get what they, uh, they state they wanted or they get a refund of what they offered. either get what you wanted or you get a refund. And there's no other possibility. So there's nothing the smart contract could do, whether it has bugs or, uh, or uh, it's malicious or anything. There's no way to sort of, um, uh, you know, rug pull or anything like that at the basic level. There's, there's ways you could do it, uh, you know, complicated ways on top, but the basic framework um, means that if you're developing a smart contract, you don't have to worry about accidentally eating your user's funds because the, if you have a bug, the, the, the platform will catch it. And if for your user, you don't have to worry about that the smart contract is gonna run away with your money without giving you what you stated that you wanted because the, the platform protects you from that. There's also payout liveness. You've heard of bugs where funds get stuck in, in things. Uh, Zoe also guarantees that you can get your funds back. <coughs> there are um, uh, conditions in that in some cases, but uh, there's a guarantee there. Okay, and then this is just the pictures. Um, so the digital assets go back and forth between the parties to the contract and Zoe. And then the smart contract just so, sort of sends and receives information from Zoe and the parties. Uh, so you escrow your the rights, and then you say something to the smart contract, and um, there's custom behavior in the smart contract, and, the, and the, one of the APIs, for example, is reallocate. Um, it can uh, reallocate X and Y between the parties, or at least it can instruct Zoe to do that, but it never directly has access to the, to the funds, and it can only um, 
do the reallocation in ways that respect the, the offers that the parties made. Uh, and then you complete offers and then the parties get their payouts. Uh, there it is in order. Okay. Um, and that's the, <clears throat> the quick version. This is a talk that's also in our YouTube channel that, for when she gave it originally. That's the high speed version of it. Um, I have a question. I don't, I imagine you do. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind. Um, so are there, um, some kinds of smart contracts, or at least maybe on Ethereum, some kinds of Ethereum apps where the design doesn't quite fit into this notion of offers? There could be, you know and, and the platform, this isn't the only way to do things in the platform. You can sort of go around it and do your own way, but the, for example, our wallet won't interact with any apps that um, that don't follow this pattern. So the wallet sort of protects all the users in this way. You could do things another way, but you'd have to get other users to play along with you. Okay. But so far we, you know, there's, we haven't had too much trouble fitting things in just as an example. So um, uh, we, we, IBC is going to come up here and, and in IBC, you might just want to send some tokens from one chain to another. You can do that by offering uh to tokens and having a want of nothing. So you can do unilateral transfers. Um, and we have an automated market maker and, and you know, there's and governance and all those kind of stuff that, that uh, fits into this, this framework one way or another. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, is this legible? Uh, for me, my screen's kind of small. A few font sizes larger would be helpful, like a couple. Yeah, I'm not experienced with that appearance. Zoom in. Hey, look at that. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so this is a Hello World smart contract uh, following the framework. And um, so a smart contract is a JavaScript module and it exports a start function. And uh, we have not just any JavaScript, we recommend this hardened hard JavaScript. And in fact, we enforce it in various ways um, because ordinary JavaScript, uh, somebody could replace the array.push method and then you'd have this very confusing world to live in. So uh, we don't and, let uh, that happen. Quick Go question ahead. for you, Dan. And um, so in Agoric, you have the secure ECMA script. Right, and then mm -hmm. Jesse is like a subset of that. So this contract kind of written in Jesse, so to speak. Yes, no, it I, is. In fact, okay. I can I can have the tools check that. Okay. Let's see if I violated Jesse anywhere here. So if I uh, oh, nice. Yeah. So there's a lint profile for Jesse, and I happen to be I I haven't straight outside of Jesse here. Okay. Excellent. Can so you, you just write briefly. Go ahead. Entered, yeah. Can you briefly describe what Jesse is? I can. Um, so um, you start with the whole world of messy JavaScript, right? You take out non-static scoping things that you know modern programming languages don't have. So you're in strict mode. Um, you take out some uh, stuff that's dangerous that I won't mention. Uh, well, I mean, object capability security is you know what you work on in this uh, CES realm here, or box, if you're familiar with that. Okay, so that um, caller and Kali or syntax and things like that. These are my, mostly globals that you just don't get when you're in Jesse. Um, there's var and this. They're also outside Jesse and class and super. Uh, and then proxy and realm and symbol and things like that. And then um, Jesse is this uh, subset of JavaScript that we recommend for so that humans can write smart contracts, uh, you know, uh, with a chance of getting it right. Um, cool. So if you know JavaScript, um, you might try using some of those other features that are unavailable, but it seems you could the learning curve should be 
somewhat right. fast for figuring out, oh, I, I can't do it that way. So, um, okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you're in, in the editor here and you write, uh, what's some syntax that you're not supposed to use? Um, I can't even remember any because my brain is trained this way. Anyway, you'll get red squigglies underneath it, stuff like that. So you get real-time feedback. One of the nice things about uh, working in the JavaScript Flash. world is, oh, right. So if I write, uh, what's it telling me here? Class is not allowed to Jesse to find a maker function. Yeah, thanks for cool. the clue. Oh yeah. Write nice more that, bugs. Uh, Write clues. more bugs. <laughs> redefine a whatever whatever uh, Thomas just said about redefining a variable. Uh, so we have mutable variables. You can redefine variables, but you can't do things like uh, if I try to object assign. Now I don't. I might go over time if if I entertain all these questions in in line. I, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Sorry, um, that's that's how we are sometimes. Sure, I don't mind. Uh, that's how we roll. Uh, so um, this is if you just fire up Node, this would work, I think. And then if I say one, two, three, oh, sorry, array dot prototype. Yeah, see, so you don't want that. Nice. Right. Uh, but if I do here, if I do that, and if I, oops. Uh, yarn test. Uh, it'll blow up. Uh, cool. Can't do that. Uh, but if I take this out, if I just run test. So that it runs the tests every time I save. So I'm winning. Um, right. So we have JavaScript with this fun little edges around it. Um, and to do a Jesse, or sorry, to do a Zoe smart contract, you export start function, and your your uh, it gets access to something, but we're not going to use it in this in this fun, in this uh, contract. We're going to have a value that we can change that starts with hello world. And uh, we're going to have a public facet, which you, you give out widely, um, and anybody can get the value. But then there's a creator facet. So only the guy who creates, the, you know, who instantiates the contract gets, gets access to the set method and can change it. So then the, the tests, um, we write them with a thing called Ava, which is a reasonably popular testing framework. And then we customize it a little bit. And uh, you make a Zoe, Zoe, a fake Zoe service for testing purposes, and then you know uh, you get the value and you test it works, and then you set set it, and then sure enough, that worked too. Now, this little e widget here it might be a little strange. Um, so the uh, the contracts and Zoe and stuff operate in different VATs and VATs are kind of like um, iframes or something. So uh, this this call here goes between one sort of uh, event loop and another. And what happens is the method and the arguments and stuff get serialized up and sent over to Zoe and come back and it's done asynchronously. So you get a promise for the result. Um, so we avoid reentrancy hazards there. Um, so that's how the way the distributed computing works. You just have to write E around stuff, and then and for that for the price of that, you can go we can go you know, within the same machine or across machines or across blockchains or anything like that. So the asynchronous asynchronous messaging works uh, across the whole fabric. Okay, so that's hello, and then um, 
but this doesn't have any electronic rights or tokens or money or anything like that. And so here's a slightly more involved contract. Um, oh, that's testing it, sorry. Here we get points for primes. And the way this works is if you can guess the next prime number, you get, um, if you guess the first prime number, you get one point. If you guess the second prime number, you get two points, et cetera. And so um, I actually got the prime generator out of Stack Overflow, but it was written in Python and JavaScript doesn't have set default. So I had to add set default. This just takes a map and a key. And if the map has that key value, then it returns it. Otherwise it assigns the, that key to the default and gives you back the default. And so this is just a, a generator for prime. So um, actually, if I put Jesse check on top of that, I think I won't be able to use generators. Yeah. Um, so this is rocket science um, a little bit. So uh, we're, you're kind of advised against it because you might, uh, might be difficult to read the smart contract, but uh, you, you can still do it. Um, so that generates primes, believe me. Um, I've tested it and everything. Uh, so that's just ordinary JavaScript programming up, up there. And so now we start our contract. And so earlier we didn't make use of this widget that was passed in. And this is our connection to the Zoe world. This is called the Zoe contract facet. And uh, one of the things you can do is make a mint. So we're, make, we're just making up a new token. Um, I think you called them, anyway, ERC20 token. And it's pretty similar. Um, and, and then we're going to get a thing called a brand. Um, whenever you make a mint, there's a mint and an issuer and a brand. And a brand is sort of how you recognize this. It's a little bit like the uh, contract address in Ethereum, um, but it's just a JavaScript object. All right, so then we got our generator. And um, when, when the way the, uh, the clients interact with contracts uh, that make offers and stuff like that is an offer handler co comes in. Sorry, we have a public facet and then the clients can make an invitation, which is part of this business of composable smart contracts, which I won't even get into. That's a whole other thing. You can, uh, when you're participating in a contract, you can take your seat in a contract and sell it to somebody and then, you know, so that things compose. So they, on the public facet, they call make invitation. So they get an invitation and then they can make an offer. And when an offer comes in with a guess, um, if they got the guess right, then we mint some, some uh, tokens and give them to them and, and, uh, and we tell them that they won. Otherwise we say guess again. And um, if I hit save, it'll run the tests again. And so we can see that when the guess was two, the guy won and he got one token and the guess three and the guy won and he got uh, two tokens and then the guess four and nope, that wasn't right. So, they, so that is a little teeny, uh, it's like a faucet where you have to do a little bit of computing <laughs> to, get your, to get your money. Um, so that's a, you know, a 20 or 30 line uh, smart contract. Um, and then we've got, auctions and, and um, all kinds of financial instruments built in so that you can just use them instead of having to build them yourself. And that is kind of the short version of all this stuff. I do have, I did study up on IBC. Um, so I can either talk or answer questions about that, but the, awesome. the, the nice. JavaScript smart contract stuff I'm kind of done with. Yeah, thank you. There's a, um, there's a yeah, couple of questions. Nate, you see those? In the Q &A. Yeah. Okay. Um, and let me start with this one first. So um, you said that the idea behind Zoe is avoiding smart contracts um, owning the assets that that are the users are interacting with. Um, uh, and so then it lowers the risk if those are hacked. But isn't why is that different for Zoe itself? Like can Zoe be hacked? I think that's the question. Okay, yes. It um, Zoe is very central to the to the whole thing. You know, hacking Zoe would be a little bit like hacking any of validators or something. Yeah, that, it's a little bit game over at that point. So we're, you know, having extensive security reviews and that sort of thing with Zoe. It's very much uh, central to the platform. Okay, 
and let me know if I ask the question right. Um, uh, okay, so the other one is, and maybe this will relate more to IBC. Um, can I price a digital asset in Zek and get paid in Zek after the smart contract releases the asset? Or will I have to handle Agoric tokens as payment? Right. So that all comes down to how Zek gets in and out of out of Zoe. Um, and so, um, let's let's say for the sake of argument that we it's the glorious future and there's a really awesome decentralized secure bridge, and so people can get some sort of wrapped Zek token on mm -hmm. Agoric. If that were all true, so there's sort of, we could explore that. And I think we will when we're talking about IBC. But if that is all true, now can I price my offers um, in terms of that token? Yes, when tokens come over IBC, uh, they just show up like any other token here. I was playing around with photons, which are from the Cosmos testnet. And so um, I had to fidget around a whole lot, but uh, then I had photons and I had photons over IBC in my uh, purse and I can you know, send it to smart contracts and make offers and do all that kind of stuff. So it's just an ordinary token in, in, the, in the JavaScript framework. Right. So if I understand correctly, as a smart contract writer, if I mm -hmm. care about specific assets, I make sure I'm coding logic around like, that recognizes those brands. Correct or if I'm making kind of a general thing that any assets can use like an AMM, um, I can do that also. Yes, yeah, so one of the things you can do, for example, is const, uh, you call zcf.getterms and you have something like brands and you say, uh, so this is the, um, Oh, let's see the uh, wages, and then uh, so now we have a wage brand. And if somebody if somebody instantiates this contract and puts the wrap zec as the, uh, you can either have issuers or yeah you know, brands anyway. If they if they fire up the smart contract and give the the zec issuer, um, Sorry, the you know, Zek issuer and the Zek brand here. Then this thing will traffic in Zek. It won't be able to. It, it wouldn't be able to mint it because the Zek mint is. You know, I can't just make Zek out of nowhere. <laughs> That's why I had to make a mint in order to just give out stuff. Cool. So the other piece of the question is how does Zek get to Agoric in the first place? And there's no answer currently. Um, right. And there are different possibilities, but kind of the most obvious one is IBC. Um, can you explain a little bit about what IBC is and how Agoric interacts with it um, generally? And then what does it look like at the smart contract layer? Somebody's, can other people mute? I keep hearing background talking. So, thanks. So IBC, inner blockchain, communication or IBC, yeah. Um, uh, so in general, it's a way to send to sort of data packets between um, blockchains and the, 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 they come with sort of a proof that they actually happened on the, on the other blockchain, right? So they come with a Merkle proof or that kind of thing. Um, and so the receiving end, if it, cares to listen to that blockchain and you send it a Merkle proof, it's sort of compelled to accept that there was such a transaction, you know, a, data, a packet emitted from the other blockchain. So that's the messaging layer. And then there's conventions on top of that called ICS-20 for sending tokens across. So um, I was figuring out how this actually works. Um, and I made a picture. Um, so there's, you know, the Cosmos Hub testnet and Agoric Dev 6, which is you know, we have an ordinary, well, or extraordinary, it's, it's really cool uh, Cosmos blockchain, but it's also a Cosmos blockchain. So the regular Cosmos tools work with it. Anyway, so Agoric Dev is over here, Cosmos is over here, and I had to fire up a thing called a relayer, Hermes. And then I use the 
reasonably popular Kepler wallet that does IBC transfers. And so you can say, okay, transfer so many photons or micro photons, which is the unit of currency. The atom is the main net tokens, but on the test net, it's photons. So I can send it from one Cosmos thing to an Agoric thing. And then um, my relayer is listening on that chain and then sending to the Agoric chain. And then uh, it goes into some contract soup and ends up in my wallet is just an ordinary uh, token. Uh, well, there is one, there is kind of an important step where um, these tokens can come in from some other chain or whatever, but am I gonna treat them as, as valuable currency? So there's a, there's a step in my um, wallet where I say, I'm gonna import, a, oh, sorry. Um, I'm gonna import an issuer. And that's kind of the trust decision where you say, it's kind of like grabbing the ERC20 uh, token address and saying, yeah, I'm gonna actually accept that as money. Uh, so if I, okay. I could import, import a new. Um, okay, say, and when you import, you're pasting some sort of like opaque blob yeah. that's hopefully cryptographically authenticated. And you, so do people rely on, um, this is actually a general question I've had about, um, is it ICS20, the, the IBC mm -hmm. standard for tokens? Um, what happens if two tokens want the same ticker symbol? Like I wanna make a new token and call it Atom. Uh, what do wallets do? So I, my understanding of the Agoric wallet is I would have to convince people, hey, please import my token. Here's this blob. I'm really trustworthy. By the way, it's called Atom. Um, so that makes sense to me. Do you know if other Cosmos wallets do a similar thing? So um, yeah, the, the sort of general solution in the Agoric world is called pet names. And I could talk about that at length, but not just now. But yeah, it's, it's basically you have to convince people that, that this is a, an atom and it's worth something. And the, the convention in, in the IBC world follows to some extent the, the convention from um, uh, Uniswap, which is basically there's token lists. There's, there's a list, you know, when you're on, on Uniswap and there's 50 tokens and here's their contract addresses and it came from Bob and we know Bob's a good guy. So, um, okay. Okay, so is, did you wanna say more about IBC? Cause I have more questions about it. Um, there's lots of nitty gritty details, but I doubt that, you know, anybody who wants to reproduce the work might need to know that, but no, it, it mostly is, a bunch of smart people, including the Agoric folks, got together. It works, and it just shows up as a normal token in the in our platform. Okay, cool. So going back to the diagram, it sounded like um, there's the IBC components, including the relayer, and then there's a special purpose smart contract. Is that Pegasus? So yes. that any IBC token can just show up in a user's Agoric wallet. And so I'm assuming once it's there, you can interact with any Agoric smart contract that supports those brands. Right. And and those smart contracts don't have to know anything about IBC. That's they correct. Just, oh, that's cool. Um, interesting, okay. So one thought about that is, it seems like the IBC um, pipeline, lets users move assets across and then smart contracts can do stuff once it's over on Agoric. Are there plans in the future for smart contracts to be able to like more directly transfer to like target destinations on another Cosmos blockchain? Yeah, you can send back as well. The this, this Pegasus mm. supports sending back too. So that's straightforward. The other thing is, mm. um, so that's token transfer back and forth. The other thing that's kind of interesting is we do this distributed object messaging and you can do that over IBC. So you could actually have two Agoric blockchains, you know, communicating, you know, using JavaScript oh. object back and forth or, you know, yeah, anybody else. Really cool. So the, the, the smart contracts over here can actually inspect the packets. And, and if somebody made up a new protocol, you can you sort of dynamically deploy JavaScript that, that understands the new protocol, whether it's our cool. um, distributed object framework or somebody else's something. 
Okay, I noticed a, a question in chat. Um, it's a question about IBC and price authorities. Um, is IBC at play when integrating something like the chain link price feed scenario? Um, DIBC. Oh, sorry, DIBC. That is an interesting question. Uh, I think our current chain link technology doesn't directly involve IBC nor DIBC. Um, but that's a little fuzzy and my, that would take me another three days to, to, to get all the bits and pieces to exactly understand it. But um, yeah, so the, the chain link is a different protocol. And so it, it sort of, um, I don't know exactly how it integrates. There is a, there is a, a thing called band protocol that, that's a, a Cosmos zone that speaks IBC. Um, but I also don't have very much experience with that. So what, uh, can you give us the basic difference between IBC and dynamic, dynamic IBC, DIBC? Oh, um, so uh, it's kind of specialization thing. So IBC is this general ship records or ship bytes around, you know, mm -hmm. they tend to be right. JSON things. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things you can do with it is, uh, is ICS-20, the, you know, token transfer standard. Um, and then the rest of it is DIBC in a way. The rest of it is, okay, uh, you just put more JavaScript on the chain and it does whatever the new protocol is without mm -hmm. upgrading your, your uh, you don't have to take the blockchain down or upgrade it or all that kind of stuff. You just sort of right. okay. put more smart contracts out there. Great. So yeah, we still have more questions trickling in. Um, Oh, the question was, if you have two Agorica blockchains, um, what does that mean? Um, so <laughs> it's not really on our, on our plans or anything like that. Uh, well, on the other hand, so the, the Agoric company right, builds the software, and then our validator community um, decides what to do with it. Um, so we plan to, so currently this, uh, this is our main net, which is only running Cosmos layer stuff. It doesn't have the JavaScript stuff. And we expect at some point there'll be a governance vote to take the, the JavaScript stuff and, and make it live and stuff. Um, but if somebody else wanted to reproduce the whole system, you know, just do it again, it's all open source. Uh, so there could be another one. The other thing is if, um, you know, we got to scaling limits and wanted to just do horizontal scaling, just fire up another zone and off you go. All right. So question, that, and this may be a couple levels below um, like IBC, that you mentioned governance and I know Cosmos is a pretty, you know, the, the design intent is for it to be pretty modular. Like you can pull in common modules like governance, for example. Did, did, did y'all use like the, the I don't know. I hate to call it off the shelf governance module, but did you leverage the module that's available in the SDK? So yes, the um, the our mainnet is has the Cosmos governance module in it, okay. um, and then we are also building a bunch of uh, governance stuff on top of that. So okay, yeah, there's a bunch of JavaScript smart contracts and stuff that I actually am pretty deeply involved in that kind of stuff, but uh, okay. pluggable governance stuff, yeah. Okay, all right, so you, we, then with a module like governance, you can kind of pull in the base and then if there's some specifics for your um, application blockchain, you can just add those on top, whatever, uh, through whatever means uh, is best for you. Right, so um, yeah, this is Cosmos governance and it's in its stake weight voting and stuff. So there's, mm -hmm. and there's right. yes or no proposals and all that kind of stuff. And then at, at the JavaScript smart contract layer, it's, it's not, a, sorry, it's not a matter of building a separate blockchain. It's just a matter of putting more contracts into the Agoric economy, if you like. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the governance does things like, okay, um, we'll have a stake weight vote to elect a committee. And then the committee will be in charge of the interest rate on the AMM. And then mm -hmm. the committee can replace itself with some other form of governance and that kind of thing. Okay. All right. So if um, like open source hackers are on this call or watch a video later, 
and they were curious about Agoric, how could they get involved? And what areas um, do you think, do you see a need for like more contribution or you're, you're hoping to see more contribution, especially if they like Zcash, by the way? Right. Um, so, uh, right. So agoric.com, you know, and if you're a developer, you just go to the documentation. Um, one of the things that's not as uh, prominent as it could be is agoric.com slash discord is how you play the games in here. Um, uh, so there's development and smart contracts and stuff. So that's definitely the way to get involved. The We do have some bounties posted. Um, so, and several of them are cross-chain uh, bounties. Uh, so those are sort of, those are the, the sort of closest thing that I can think of to, to the Zcash situation. Um, so once you get, um, the Zcash side has to, would have to play the IBC game, right? Right. And at that point, there's all kinds of yeah. fun things to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, maybe I got a question for you, which is if you did some sort of uh, interoperability protocol, is there any hope of doing shielded stuff across? I guess you could do them as NFTs. So, um, yeah, my thinking on that is, um, like, from my perspective, strategically, it seems wise to just plug into what works well. Um, and so that could be IBC. And if we did that, then um, from the user, like let's, from the user's perspective, let's say they want to participate in an Agoric contract like an AMM and they have a Zcash shielded wallet. And so their funds are sort of sitting in this private store of value. Um, then they might be able to do an interaction with that smart contract. And in the ideal world, the wallet is going to take care of getting the funds out of the Zcash shielded pool across IBC. So the value would become revealed, but it would have mm, no okay. history. Um, and then that value would show up on that user's um, either like at the contract in Agoric or at that user's wallet mm -hmm. in Agoric and then they can interact. And then later they could withdraw kind of on the reverse path back to their private storage. Um, and so if a user is interacting that way and with multiple different apps or smart contracts, it has this um, privacy property of sort of unlinking all of their activity okay. and also yeah. making it less distinguishable from all other users who are doing the same with their shielded Zcash wallets. So I feel like that's already uh, a really good step and that's just plugging into existing, something existing like IBC. And then um, research on like how to add better privacy to bridges or smart contracts is definitely something I'm interested in longer term. Right. Um, I just see it as like, that's a longer term. Goal. Yeah. Um, one other thing to mention in that area, which is the, so the stuff I've been talking about is this Agoric framework running on a, a public blockchain, but you can run it on a single machine or, or a, a cluster or a consortium uh, chain or something like that. So you can, you can do your, your smart contract stuff you know, in the privacy of your own, whatever it is, um, if you choose. So that's, that's just another room. option. Yes. <laughs> or your own consortium, whatever you have, you know, whatever, whoever the parties you, you know, you're, you're happy dealing with. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to share that. Uh, I wanted to do a quick check to see if anyone, um, wanted to share about any other projects they're working on. I didn't notice scanning through the chat. I didn't notice anyone raise their hand for the open mic. So unless they speak now. Okay, I think there's a new question from Thomas Greco. Um, 
Uh, the question is, this might be a question for the Zcash team. Would it be possible to write ZK Snorks in JavaScript and use that code for enabling privacy within transactions? Um, yeah, my, I, I'm sort of going out on a limb here. I think it might be possible. It might be not very practical, like the, the um, cost in time or memory to uh, generate those proofs in JavaScript might be really cumbersome, um, but it might be possible with some use cases. The question, um, I'd, oh, yeah. sorry, Nate, go ahead. Uh, that's just my. I, I was gonna actually kind of ask Dan something generically about modules. So in a, in a module, could you have a module that was like written in, let's just say Rust, for example, that, you know, leverage Halo 2 um, to do some sort of, you know, proof verification, for example, um, and then call that from your JavaScript smart contract? You could kind of move um, those snarks into Rust or something? Not anytime soon, um, okay. but these, uh, so these VATs, um, sort of are can't tell what the programming languages the other vats are written in in a right. way mm -hmm. so uh doing one of them in wasm for example uh is is you know we can imagine doing that um and there's there was a little bit of prototyping in rust early on of the actually the the um kernel that goes between them not the vats themselves but mm -hmm. um yeah if you want to play rocket science yeah these things are are within the realms of possibility um mm -hmm. they're not you know, straightforward engineering by any means. Right, sure. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Dan, for coming and showing up to the gardening club and sharing. Um, I'm really excited about this stuff. I think it's um, mm -hmm. it's it's yeah. really promising. Uh, I notice a lot of little de details, um, which I compare to Ethereum, because that's, I, I'm not, um, super familiar with smart contracting and all the different platforms. I've just sort of watched Ethereum for a while. Mm -hmm. And there's, I'm just aware that there's so many snags or hurdles and I can see how they're kind of ironed out in um, a lot of ways here. So I'm really excited to see how that goes. So thanks for sharing. And thanks for having me. Yep, thanks, yeah. Dan. All right, um, so I think that concludes this episode of the Zcash Gardening Club. Thanks for everyone for showing up and asking great questions. Thanks, Nate, for See driving. you in February. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.